So NEMA 1450 outlets like this are pretty much the de facto standard for high voltage 240 volt EV charging, at least in the US. And a few months ago, I installed one at my in-laws beach house and I put out the video for you guys. And I got a lot of comments on that video. And in particular, three issues were raised of things that I did not do quite correctly. Now, I say quite correctly because I'm still within the correct way of doing it, but I wouldn't always be. And so I want to rectify these issues and kind of point them out one by one as I install a new outlet here at my home. First off is the outlet that I used. And I just went to Home Depot and picked out a 10 to $15 Leviton outlet, I believe it was. And this is a UL approved outlet. It's definitely approved to use in the US on residential, you know, for ranges or, or even EV charging if you want to. However, in going through post after post online, people have begun to realize that these, ta these outlets can be kind of dangerous for EVs. And the reason being an EV is drawing up to 40 amps on that outlet continuously for say eight hours. And that is much more than what these outlets are originally designed for. They're designed for powering a stove or a range or something like that, which is on for you know, a brief period of time and then shuts off. Whereas an EV is a really long extended period of time. And that can tend to end up melting the outlets eventually. The other thing is if you have a mobile connector and you're plugging in and out from the outlet many times, those outlets are not made for that. They're made to be put behind your stove and you kind of plug it in once and you leave it there for years until you move and then it comes out. And you know, it's a handful of you know, insertions and removals. Whereas an EV, you might be plugging in and out every day or every few days. And that can loosen the prongs and over time that looseness reduces the conductivity through the connection and that generates heat. So what's recommended is to use an industrial style outlet. And Tesla originally recommended one by Hubble. It's been recommended by a lot of people on YouTube and online. And it sent the price through the roof to the point where that outlet is over $100, sometimes over $150 just for the outlet. Fortunately, as has been pointed out by several other people, Hubble makes a off-branded outlet. Uh, it's called Bryant. Uh, it's not really generic in that it does have a brand, but it's definitely made by Hubble. And that is what I have here. So this is virtually identical to the Hubble outlet, the $150 one, uh, but I got these for about $50 each. I actually got two of them. It's a bigger outlet than the Leviton that I previously used uh, in diameter, so you do need a different plate uh, for, the, for covering it. And it's also a little thicker, so you need a deeper wall box. The first step to install the new outlet is turning off the power. And then since this is an existing circuit with a wall box, I remove the cover or faceplate to the wall box and then unscrew the outlet from the wall box. Once it's unscrewed and pulled out, you can simply unscrew the wires from the outlet and disconnect it. Since the Brian outlet is a little bit thicker, I do need a new wall box. But fortunately, it's just a tiny bit thicker, so I can still use a different PVC box. I don't need the metal box with the offset cover plate. So I removed that and slapped my new box onto the wall. Next, I cleaned up the wire ends, just chopping off the old wires and then stripping them off so that they were all clean and nice. A huge advantage of the Brian outlet is the way that the wires are clamped. In the old one, they were simply clamped under these screws, which doesn't make a nice connection. But on the Bryant outlets, there's this nice yoke that is tightened by the Allen screw, and that contains the wire much more securely. Finally, it's a simple matter of slipping the phases into their appropriate holes and then tightening them up with the Allen wrench. That is one interesting feature of this outlet is using an Allen head screw to tighten that yoke instead of a regular Phillips screw. This allows you to go a lot tighter and more securely without having to worry about it slipping. And then finally, I torque these connections, which is not something I've done before. The torque spec on these is 75 inch pounds, which is quite a bit. With the wires torqued, I simply fastened the outlet into the box and then finished it up with a new faceplate to fit the larger outlet diameter.
The second thing that was pointed out to me is the gauge of wire that I used. I used an 8 gauge THHN wire, which is rated for up to 90 C at 55 amps. And so that is good on a 50 amp circuit, technically. However, it terminates at both ends. And if the terminations in the breaker or in the receptacle are not rated for 90 C, I need to derate. Fortunately for me, the terminations were rated at 75 C, so my D rate went from 55 amps to 50 amps on that wire. However, my new Bryant outlet is only rated to 60 C, so that takes us to 40 amp maximum on an eight gauge wire. And so what I'm doing, instead of ripping out the wire and putting in a six gauge, I'm just gonna replace it with a 40 amp breaker. Now, there are additional D rate considerations if you have more than three current carrying conductors in a single conduit, or if your ambient temperatures are very high, or if the conduit is directly exposed to sunlight. But all of these things are way beyond the scope of this video and something I didn't need to worry about since I only have three current carrying conductors in my conduit. Before working on the sub panel, I turned off the breaker to that panel. Then I was able to disconnect the wires from the old 50 amp breaker and pull them out of the breaker before I removed that breaker from the panel. From here, it's simply a matter of popping in the new breaker, connecting the wires to it, and then I did torque them. So the torque on this end of the wire was 45 inch pounds, which is what was specified by the breaker. The 2020 National Electric Code requires that all outlets in a garage be GFCI protected or ground fault circuit interrupter protected. And for 120 volt outlets, you simply replace the outlets with one of those squarish outlets that you see in your bathroom or your kitchen with the test and reset buttons. But for a larger outlet, like a 240 volt outlet, you actually put the GFCI on the breaker or you get a GFCI breaker. This is a very new code and it currently does not apply everywhere. And in my state of Pennsylvania, it does not currently apply. We're still in the 2017 NEC code. However, it will be coming and I believe soon, probably everywhere, will be required to have GFCI breaker protection on these 240 volt outlets. That being said, I do not really want to install one at this point in time. And the reason is that it causes some interesting issues. For electric vehicles, it's well known and documented that the GFCI can trip inadvertently when nothing is really wrong. And I'm not sure if this is due to some circuitry in the car and losses from the car as it's charging. It's a pretty big area to have uh, ground fault losses from, but it could also be due to the fact that the EVSC or the charging brick in your mobile connector also has GFCI protection. And the two systems working together can potentially interfere. So I am not currently installing the GFCI protection on my outlet. That being said, I would recommend you always follow the codes in your area. But like I said, I'm also not recommending that you use a GFCI on your outlet for your EV charger. Interestingly, the alternative to this is to install a wall mounted unit that is wired in and those do not need GFCI breakers. They have it built into the unit and it's basically hardwired. So you do not need that protection on the outlet. So that going forward is probably a good way around this issue. And there we go. We've swapped over the chintzy little 1450 for the really beefy Bryant 1450. And as you guess, I have another one here. So I have another one to do uh, for some of my testing equipment that I'm putting together. As I always say, if you do not feel comfortable doing this work, hire an electrician to do it. They're gonna know all the codes in your area and they're gonna do everything up to snuff to make sure everything is good. So I wanted to kind of show you the proper way of installing a NEMA 1450. Maybe I still messed up. If I did, there might be another video to come out after this. But for now, this covers everything I know about installing a NEMA 1450 outlet for EV charging. And I will see you guys in the next video.